I'm so thankful for his presence. I'm thankful for your, for your presence. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord today as we turn to Nehemiah chapter 2 and 17. Sometimes you just need to get to church. You know what I mean? There's nothing like it. And uh, I know I, I just had to get here. Get me in a better, helps me out. Amen. Sometimes it's challenging to get to the house, but I, I never regret coming. I'm going to tell you today, I was like, I got to get there. I got to get to the house of God. I landed last night in Houston late. And I don't know, my wallet was, i taken it out because I don't sit on it. You're supposed to sit on your wallet because it gives you back pain. Right, Brother Tommy? And that pilot hit the brakes hard my wallet. And I couldn't find it. We looked for an hour. So someone got blessed wherever that plane landed. Yeah, so I was upset. Had had cash in it don't keep a lot of cash typically but I had some cash you know my credit cards so anyway that was my night got home got still kind of frustrated this morning but then I came in the house of the Lord and it's you know it seems like insignificant sometimes the most insignificant things you get under your skin you know what I mean then you come into the house of the Lord come on you lift your hands you hear you see wonderful praise team I, I love seeing Maddie young lady worshiping God come on and I'm encouraged it's going to be all right. Everything, come on, whether it's something perhaps small that's happened, perhaps your world's falling apart. Our God is able. There's nothing impossible. He can do all things. Nehemiah 2, 17, if you're there, say amen. We're reading from the New King, King James Version this morning. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies in waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good unto me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us, arise, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. But when Sanballat, the Hornite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, official, Geshem, heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the remaining, Rachel. I'm just going to give a title to my remarks. There's a wall in my rubble. Look at your neighbor and say, There's a wall in my rubble. There's a wall in my rubble. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy, all that you are, all that you've done, and all that you're going to do. Thank you for your people, their place, and the presence of God that is evident in this house. As we turn to the timeless pages of your word, I pray, Lord, that you would anoint me to preach, deliver, Lord, this incredible, incredible word, this wonderful word to these wonderful people. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, why don't you give the Lord a great praise? Go ahead, just for another moment. Unpracticed, unrehearsed, without a track, loop, bass, drum, or guitar. Come on, no keyboard, just you. Now I wonder if you could add some words to the clap. Jesus, I love you. Thank you, Jesus, for this incredible life. Thank you for my, just thank him for something. Think of something. God, thank you for my family, my children. Thank you for the roof over my head and the food in my belly. Thank you for the car parked out in that driveway. Thank you, Lord, for the bike I came to church on. Thank you, Jesus, that I live in America. Thank you, Jesus, for this great life. I love you, Jesus. You've been good. You're worthy. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Thank you for standing in honor of the word of the Lord. It is our text today that we find a familiar passage where the people of God are returning to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The reason they have to rebuild is because they've been torn down. And uh, several hundred years uh, prior to all of this, Judah had vacillated from righteousness to idolatry. They had gone back and forth from living for God to living for the world, to living for God to, have, to be an in, to be an out. To be an in, to be an out. And you know what you mix happens when you mix hot and cold? Gets lukewarm. You're hot sometimes, you're cold sometimes. In Revelation 3 and 15, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. He said, I wish you were one or the other. He said, but because you're lukewarm, 
neither hot nor cold. He said, I'm going to spew you out of your mouth. It's like I was at Subway the other day. I said, you got some iced tea for me? She said, yeah. And, and I hadn't put the ice in it yet. And I just put the tea in and I took a swig and it was like, it wasn't hot. And it wasn't cold. And I was like, ugh. You, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I like hot tea. And I like iced tea. But I don't like lukewarm tea. There's just something about lukewarm tea. It makes me want to puke. You know what I mean? And that's how God is. He's like, man, either be hot or be cold. He said, if you're going to do it, he said, if you're going to live for the devil, live for the devil. He said, if you're going to live for me, live for me. But stop trying to do it one and eh, 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 eh. Try, stop trying to seesaw this thing. Let's just get in all the way. Either I've told people that all the time. I've told young people that. I said, if you ain't going to live for God with all your heart, stop wasting your time. Don't miss out on the pleasures of sin for a season. If you ain't going to be all in, go get drunk, get high, have sex, do that thing because it is enjoyable for a season. Come on, somebody. Now, the Bible even says that. It is enjoyable for a season. And if you're going to go to hell, don't go to hell lukewarm. Don't go to hell and miss out on the party. I'm off of my notes right here, but I'm going to tell somebody, if you're going to live for the devil, live for the devil. But if you're going to live for God and you're just going to be a come every once in a while, sit on the back row, never come to the altar, never get involved, never participate. You know what God said? You know what? You're, it's more disgusting than the most vile sinner. So if you're going to live for the devil, just live for the devil. If you're going to live for God, live for God. I made up my mind. If I'm going to be in this, I'm in it all the way. I'm going to be aisle running puge. I'm taking advantage. Come on. If I'm going to be a sinner, I can guarantee you. If I was a sinner, Nick, you'd want to be my friend. Because I would be the best sinner that ever sinned. I would smoke it, drink it, do it, sleep with it. Do, I'd steal it. I'd run it. I'd do whatever. I, I would have the biggest party. I wouldn't sleep. I would go to hell and split it wide open. I would, Tommy. I ain't going to play around. I, I don't understand people playing around. Come on, somebody. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it with all my heart. So don't look at me weird when you were out in the club smoking, drinking. You were mixing up Drano and drinking it. Come on. Then you come to church. Oh, take, come on, man. Let's live for God with everything we got. Don't be looking at us, funny visitor. If you want some casual, lukewarm church, they're a dime a dozen. But we made up our mind that his word is like a fire. So we run on Sunday and we shout on Sunday night and we put our hands together because living for God is only enjoyable if you do it all the way. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, in and out. Kind of in the world, kind of in the church. Kind of, come on. And God's like, Ugh. Finally, he says, I. He says, my, 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 my judgment against them will be captivity. The Babylonians will come in and we will annihilate the entire city, the walls, the, the, t the temple. And it happens in 587 B.C. Armies come against the city of Jerusalem. The uh, temple of Solomon is plundered destroyed completely this is incredible because it is Solomon's temple that in based on the numbers I could find from 20 and 22 in modern currency it would have cost 300 billion dollars to build this building now that was in 2022 it would be about 600 billion in 2024 so he has a 600 billion dollar let's, let's okay we'll settle $400 billion. In the history of the world, there's been no building constructed of that magnitude. I mean, the Bur Khalif, the tallest building in the world, is $1.5 billion. The most expensive building in the world right now that's ever been built is $120 billion. Here's what's sad. It's, it's the Grand Mosque in Saudi Arabia. Buddhist temple in uh, Asia somewhere, $22 billion. St. Peter's Basilica, the Catholics have a $1 billion building. Uh, Lady of Our Lords has a uh, $189 million building in Los Angeles. The, the, the most expensive Protestant church in America is $130 million. First Baptist in Dallas uh, is $130 million. So that's, you know, compared to $400 billion. In, in Allegiant Stadium, that, that church it cost $1 billion, $1.9 billion. 
AT&T Center, that church costs $1.3 billion. So anybody get an attitude over us building a $14 million little pimple over here? You, you go ahead and slap your own self. I, I can't wait till the day. Come on, somebody. I can't wait for the day. I think our God, if, if their gods of football and basketball get, get churches of $1.9 billion, I just think the God that made everything is worthy of the greatest, the grandest, and the most beautiful. That's just how I look at it. And maybe you'd say I'm weird. I, I'll just go ahead and confirm it. I am weird. I am so crazy about Jesus. I believe that if the mosque is one $120 billion, my God's done way more for me than Muhammad ever did. And so this 300 or $400 billion building is leveled and left into rubble. The people of God now are are captives in Babylon. They have been so for 70 years, captive to a pagan culture. And then in 446 BC, a Jewish servant by the name of Nehemiah receives a charter from the Lord to return to Jerusalem and rebuild and rebuild the walls. When he, when he arrives, he found that not only were the walls and the temple in ruin, but the people living in the city were still battling the mental torments of past defeats. The destruction of the city had done more than just destroy the buildings. It had destroyed the mindset and the spirit of the people. Sometimes what you go through can get in you. So you got to guard when you go through destruction that destruction doesn't get in you. Let me say it one more time. So you went through destruction, but that doesn't mean destruction has to get in you. Everything fell apart around me, but I didn't fall apart. But he was dealing with people who had fallen apart. You can, I'm telling you, you can go through marital stuff and it can break you down. You can go through losing jobs and it can cause you to lose your joy. But thank God for Nehemiah. Thank God for the man of God. Thank God for a leader of faith. Thank God there was a preacher of righteousness uh, that showed up. Uh, amen. I tell you what you need on Sunday morning when your world is falling apart uh, and all you have is ruin in your life. Uh, you need a preacher of righteousness. Uh, you say, well, I don't really need a preacher. I am a believer. I, I believe on my own. Well, it's actually not even possible. It's not possible. Romans 10 and 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing uh, and hearing by the word of God. If you want faith, it's only one way. To, there's one, you, you, your car needs gasoline. If you're going to fill up your car with gasoline, you can't just go out and say, you know what, I'll spit in it and it'll drive. No, you have to go to a gas pump and you have to put money in that thing and you have to put gas in it. Let me tell you what the gas, the fuel of your faith is. It is the hearing of the word of God. You need to hear. Faith is linked to what you listen to. I said, faith is linked to your ear. You ought to just grab your ears and say, thank God for these two things right here. I got, I got two of them in one mouth. I should be listening more than talking. I got, I got, I got ears. I got ears. I get faith comes by hearing. But not only does it come by hearing, it comes by hearing the word of God. I need, I need to hear the word of God. I need to hear the word of God. Come on, if faith can come by hearing, so can doubt. Say that again. If faith can come by hearing, so can doubt. That's why the enemy in Nehemiah 4, 1 and 3, so it happens when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the walls, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke in verse 2. He began to talk before his brethren and the army of Samaria. And he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Notice, he didn't call a secret meeting to talk about them. He talked about them in open. They would write letters to them in open. He talked out loud. He made posts on the internet. He, made, he said it loud enough. He wasn't even talking to his people. He was talking to God's people. Come on. And that's what the enemy will do. He will speak words of doubt. He will speak words that you're going to fail. What, what will they do? What are you going to do? They're, they're going to offer, say, you're going to offer sacrifices. What are you going to do? Go down to your church and run the aisles. What are you going to do? Go down there and clap your hands. What are you going to do? Go up there to the altar call. Oh, yeah, you holy roller. I mean, you think you're going to get it all fixed in a day and have revival? You really think you're going to build that building? You really think you're going to make a comeback? You really think you're going to get free from drugs? 
difference by going to a Pentecostal church with the crazy people. Oh, you know what? You think you got those ladies that don't cut their hair and those owl running people. You think that's what he does. That's what he does. That's what he says. But, but my faith is linked to what I listen to. My faith is, I'll say it again, my faith is linked to what I listen to. And so there's just some things I listen to. And there's some things I don't listen to. There's some people I listen to. There's some people I don't listen to. Several years ago, I just said, you know what, I'm done listening to talk radio. All they do is talk negative. I, I, I check in on the news every once in a while, but it's every once in a while. I don't, I don't need, it seems like even Fox News, which is supposed to be the good one, they don't ever have good news. It's always bad. It's just bad from a different angle. It's who's doing the bad. The one side says the other side's doing the bad, and this side says the other side's doing the bad, and the right side says the left is bad. Come on, somebody. So you know what side I decided to listen to? I decided to listen to the Lord's side. Now, are you on the right or are you on the left? I'll tell you what side. I'm on the up. I'm on the upside. I'm on the heavenly side. Because every time I turn into that news, it's called gospel, which means good news. You know what could help your faith? Turning off CNN. You ain't ever going to be happy listening to a man that's last name is Lemon. You ain't ever going to be happy listening, come on, to somebody that's always telling you negativity whose hope is in a politician who's hope come on the only trump my hopes in is in a trump that'll sound and you need to get your faith out of Fox News you need to get your hope out of CNBC and say you know what I'm gonna listen to the word of the Lord I'm tuned into Eastgate UPC I'm turned into my pastor and you know what the word of the Lord is we're gonna rebuild the wall there's a wall in your rubble there's hope in your mess I've just had to, I just had to turn it off. Just, just disconnect from people. Like Michelle told me last week, we went on a Valentine's date. We were talking. She said, I'm going to tell you one of the best things I've done is get off social media. She said, I'm so happy. It's amazing how we're all like, oh, yeah, social media is so awful. And then we're all on it. <laughs> Pretty amazing, isn't it? I don't have to answer every call. I can't. I, I got to hear the word of God. Oof. Well, preacher, how do, I hear, how do I hear the word? Well, here's how you hear the word of God. How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed in? How shall they believe in whom they've not heard? He said, you've heard, you've got to hear, but how do you hear? He said, without a preacher, not a teacher. You've got to have teaching, but you've got to have preaching, and there is a difference. Let me say that again. He says, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord. So how do you hear the word of the Lord? You hear it through preached word of God. And preaching is what, as a matter of fact, he says it is the foolishness of preaching that he chose to save. Your salvation is linked to hearing preaching. I, I, I'll pause right here. I'm off my notes. There is a difference in teaching and preaching. Teaching educates you. Having itching ears, the Bible says, they will heap unto themselves teachers. You've got it, but yet without teaching, they perish for lack of knowledge. So you do have to be taught. However, we have an abundance of teachers. For teaching speaks to the intellect, and we learn, and oh my, we just love. But then you become puffed up in your, come on. Preaching, on the other hand, is confrontational. Preaching requires anointing. The anointing of God comes upon a preacher and a preacher will begin to preach things with a boldness that he would not even preach in and of himself. I'm going to tell you what the, the anointing does. It, extrapolates, it pulls out what the preacher really believes. When you get anointed by God in a pulpit and before people, as you begin to preach to people, the anointing will pull out what is really inside of you. Some man that does not preach the truth, who refuses to preach holiness and separation from the world, it is not that he's not anointed, it's just maybe he don't believe it. 
or he may believe it, but he's just not anointed. You've got to get anointed. That's why you got to get every preacher needs to get into a prayer room uh, and find an anointing, and they've got to get convictions that are in their heart. A man that refuses to preach the truth doesn't believe the truth. I'll say it one more time. I said they do not believe the truth. If they won't preach it, they don't believe it. They, in the office, when you can say, well, now, let's, oh, yeah, I, I believe that. Well, if you believe it, preach it. Get anointed and preach it because when I get anointed, I step off that platform and, and the devil hits me and says, what did you just do? You fool, you crazy man and my flesh says, oh my God, what did I just do? But then the Lord says, you believed it. I anointed you to preach it. You declare things that are not as though they are. What's the solution for this generation? Preaching. We've got to get back to preaching. Come on, how shall they hear? How shall they hear without a preacher? Come on, I'm all about teaching. Teach us, teach me how to live, teach me how to live. But, but, but sometimes we gotta, put, we gotta just take the little bar stool and throw it to the side. Come on, turn the lights on. And preaching is, preaching is uh, teaching is information. Preaching is confrontation. Preaching is conf conf confronting the sin in society. Preaching confronts the sin in my life. That's why you've got to get to church. And that's why the devil does not ever want you to get to church. I'm going to say it again. The devil does not want you to get to church. Why? He's afraid of a preacher. He knows if he can get you in front of a preacher, you'll pick up your hammer, you'll pick up that trial, and you'll say, there's a wall in my rubble. There's a miracle in my mess there's a hope in this disaster I can do it I can do it when you came in you thought you was gonna die when you walked out you said we can live what happened preaching ah you need to challenge yourself and what I what I, I want to give you just a challenge is in prep this is a good little thing though I just thought of it this morning what about this week every week here's a cool thing about the internet you can listen to preaching nonstop. So you, here's what we're going to do. Shelby, we're going to do a, a, a playlist of preaching. I want to challenge you, some practical. Every day this week, listen to preaching. Listen to a whole sermon. Well, I, my goodness, I'm going to miss Michael Berry. What am I going to do with John Hannity? You're going to turn him off and the world ain't going to fall apart because you didn't hear how bad it was. Just one week. Try it one week. Try it one week where you normally are listening to all the negativity. We're going to put together a preaching playlist of faith. It doesn't have to be me. But if you do, we'll do some, we'll do some royalties or deal or something here. That, you know, I don't know what I'll do. I'll work a royalty deal with Shelby. I don't know how we're going to do it, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> but But... And I'm not talking about some preacher that don't believe truth. I'm talking about a dude that's preaching truth to you. And you get that up in your earphones. You be driving down, your, down the road and you start here listening to preaching and guess what? Faith will start rising. You'll be driving your little Toyota Camry. Come on, and all of a sudden, come on, you'll think a wheel's out of alignment because it'll be shaking you. you. Come on, you'll be driving in your truck and all of a sudden you think, I gotta put it in four-wheel drive. I'm on something rough. No, that's the Holy Ghost. That's faith beginning to... Oh, thank God for the preaching of the word of God. Thank God. Come on, the reason some of you are dry is because you've stopped listening to the preaching. Come on, you've got to listen. And then he, oh, I'm a, he said, listen. Bible doesn't say listen. He says faith comes by. Yeah, there's a whole lot different. All the, all the, all the married women say amen. Because he can listen and not hear. Let me, oh, come on. But I got to hit you married ladies because some of y'all can listen and not hear. I got to hit Matthew Tuttle because sometimes I listen and I don't hear. Pa Preacher, I don't just want to listen to the sermon and be entertained by the points and find out how you're connecting them and how you're going to bring a new revelatory truth about a fact I've believed in my whole life to make me go, whoo, man, that was good preaching. That's not what we're doing. I feel something in the Holy Ghost. 
I'm not up here just putting points together that articulate well homiletically to bring you to a place of arousing applause to say, wow, my pastor can sure preach good. That's not the mission. That's not what I'm called to do. I'm not a public speaker that stands before people to entertain. I am the fuel station. I'm Valero to your faith. I'm Exxon Mobil to your miracle. You need, oh, you've got to have me. Come on, I said you got to have preaching. Come on, America needs preachers. Preachers of righteousness, holiness. Come on, preacher, preach, preacher. Preach, preacher, preach. We're going to rebuild the wall. We're going to rebuild the wall. One problem with preaching is it don't pay good. Now, y'all treat me great. I'm an exception to the rule. So I, I, I have to wear like bulletproof vests and have security because all the other preachers are trying to take me out so they can get my church, you know, because y'all are so good to me. You spoil me, and I thank you for that. Please don't stop. <laughs> y'all laughing kind of like you're thinking about it. No, no. I like to be spoiled, and I, I please do not stop. I've done put my hard time in. I'm in my good time now. Go ahead and let me enjoy it. I said, don't stop spoiling him. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to keep spoiling him, Pastor. We're going to keep spoiling him. He needs to be, he needs to be spoiled. So, but, but it didn't always pay good. Uh, I, when I started preaching, I had to remodel houses, and I, and I still do now. I got addicted to it. It's kind of fun. And so I've remodeled, I don't know, tons of houses, at least, at least 80-something. And I've learned something. I've built new houses, and I've remodeled them. I've learned something that, that remodeling is actually more challenging the new construction. It, where's Lance? Lance. He builds new houses primarily, right? Because you, you're lazy. You know? I mean, he's a lazy. He's like, I'm a, and good for him. I mean, take the easy money. I'm all about that. It, you know? Now, he's not lazy. That's a hardworking man. He's working multiple jobs, great kids and all that. But y'all know, I'm telling you, new construction. Am I right, Jimmy? It's just a little easier because it's a clean slate. But when you're like me and you ain't rich... And you know, and you're trying to remodel a mobile home. Ooh, man. I mean, how can you put 14 big screen TVs in one of them, you know? But it's like you, you, you don't know what you're getting into. There, there's no clean slate. He's not building a new wall. He's rebuilding a wall. That means he's got to deal with the, well, that's not the way we did it last time. Well, you know, now you, what are you going to do with all this trash? Because now there's all this trash. It's not coming in nice square boxes from Lowe's ready to go. It's, it's old stuff all laying all over the... So you're having to deal with the trash of what was to build what will be. And, and, and along with people comparing it to how it was before. My heart really relates Restore, Psalm says unto me the joy of my salvation that means that at some point there in your in your life there will be some there will be some broken pieces in your life Joel says I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten and cankerworm and caterpillar and palm worm he says I'm going to restore that means that in your around your life there's rubble in your life uh, there's there's trash and, and there's garbage he says but but restoration is a little different than construction and you can't allow how it was in your past to hold you prisoner to how it's going to be in your future for your marriage to be restored uh, you're going to have to lay some down some of the well it used to be like this well when we got married well before we got married for the situation to change come on you got to say well I said you've got to stop saying things like that well it used to be well at my old church well at my at my other boss well my other pastor and I can hear Nehemiah saying yeah yeah tell me about how it used to be about the way it used to be and then it broke it didn't work. It didn't work the way it used to be. It just broke. It fell apart. Come on. And so the reason you're in the mess you're in is because you're always holding your present prisoner to what used to be. The old boss is not the current boss. Stop holding him prisoner. You got remarried because your marriage split up. That new wife is not the old wife. Stop holding this marriage prisoner. I'm not 
not your previous pastor. She's not your previous pastor's wife. We're not your previous church. Stop holding us prisoner to what was. Okay, so it went wrong there. Stop telling us about it and listen to the preacher. We're going to build the wall. We're going to build the wall. We're going to build the wall. And let's build this thing so big, so bad that no devil can tear it down. I'm building a wall. And they would build this wall in, a, in trash. And they would build this wall in a time of trouble. Because they're, they're going about. They're trying to gain the support, getting recruitment, recruiting workers. And sir, soon they, they figure out not everybody's pumped about the revival. <laughs> Man, that, that makes me so happy. That the haters hate, and and, and they and they validate. If, if everybody's for it, then then it, 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 it ain't right, man. There's some people that think that a chocolate frosty's not good. I'm serious. I mean, I don't get on social media much, but it, every once in a while I just read the comments. You could put, I love Dairy Queen. Oh, Dairy Queen is a disgusting place. They can find something negative about the queen of all ice creams. I'm like, how on earth do you find something bad about a, about a blizzard? Like you have a messed up mind. You are so negative. You can, and those same people can get negative about the things of God. They can be negative about your marriage. They can be negative about holiness and separation. Hear, O oh God, for we despise. And, and, but but, but here, 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 four and four, go quickly. Here's how you retaliate. This is what you do because I know what, what I want to do. <laughs> Some of y'all laughing because you're like, I know, I feel you. We just, we communicated just without words, you know. But we, we're telling, here's how you retaliate. Hear, O oh God, here's what Nehemiah does. Hear, O oh God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head. It's not that you can't talk about them. It's just who you talk to about them. You come into the sanctuary. You put your head right in your pew. And you say, give them for prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For thou hast provoked thee to anger before thy builder. Here's what he did. Here's the first thing he did. He ignored them. Come on, some things you got to talk, you frustrated, you got to get it out your system. And some of us get it out in the wrong place. It's okay, it's okay to be angry, it's just wrong to sin. And when you take it out on somebody, you just sin. But you can bring your frustration about your wife and your kids and your boss. And, you, and, and if you ever are frustrated at me, which would blow my mind, you would want to bring that to God. Ignore them! The greatest insult to the devil the greatest insult to the devil the greatest insult to your hater ignore pastor I don't know what to do they said this about me and I'm gonna I, I just think I've got to write a letter and I've got to make a retaliation post and I've got to say something back and I'm no 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 do you really want to tick them off you really want to make them mad don't say anything just act like they don't exist that their presence doesn't even bring realization to your consciousness that you are completely oblivious that they are even on the same planet uh, in which you live uh, come on somebody and here's what you do next verse 6 build the wall have revival keep doing what God called you to do keep living in your victory keep living in your favor keep living in your hallelujah keep living you're going to have a hater they're going to talk about you loud enough for you to hear they're going to spread it and make sure you find out they said it but don't you listen keep building I mean keep building keep building you're going to make it you just got to keep building you just, you just got to keep saying it. There, there's a wall in this rubble. Uh, it's easy to point out the rubble. When I first got into remodeling, the first house I did, I was like 21, and I looked at this house. It was over 
uh, well, my first one was actually in Indiana, but first one I did by myself was in, in Needland. And uh, it was uh, in Needland, and it was just a kind of a, it was on pier and beam, and I think drug addicts had lived in it. And it, was, it was bad. It smelled bad. They had dogs in it. Uh, it, was, it was rough. Very rough. Very rough. And maybe I told you a story. My father-in-law, I brought him over, and, and I said, man, I can get this house for $30,000. And he said, oh, son, <clears throat> this, this is, this is, this is going to be a crack house for life. <laughs> you, 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 you. And so I brought someone else over, one of the guys in the church. Oh, brother, this is, oh, oh. he's like, oh, my goodness, man. This, look at these. There's holes in the floor, the sheetrock, the air conditioning doesn't work. And, oh, man, it's horrible. It's, oh, I brought someone else. Oh, my goodness. He's like, now, he crawled up underneath it. He said, oh, bro, the joists on the bot they're broken, and, and the, the, the beams are bad, and there's pipes. Are, it's just, oh, this is bad. This is bad. It ain't hard to find somebody tell you what's wrong with it. And all of the things they were saying, I'm like, yeah, I, I see that. Yeah. Saw that the first time I walked through. It smells like dog urine. I picked up on that real fast. <laughs> I, I know the water ain't working. When I turn it come on at the main, water shoots out underneath the house. I know there's a pipe burst underneath the house. I can feel the floor. Finding the problem has never been the problem. <laughs> Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none. whoop de doo da day who cares what you don't have that's what the blind lame man saying but thank God they didn't leave it there but such as I have and dad showed up he came into town from Holland he, we drove by he didn't, he didn't even go inside he looked at the outside he said you can buy that house for 30000 he said if you don't buy it I'm buying it I was like oh hurry up quick <laughs> sign that paper come on I fixed that thing up for $18,000 then I went out and cash out refied on it it appraised at 120,000. They sent me 100,000 or 90 something thousand dollars in my little bank account. I put a renter in it, the Lamar men's basketball coach. Big crackhead. <laughs> Rented that house. And I just had a little thought, something I would do. For the Grim, you'd have rental property. He said, Where do you want me to deliver the rent every month? I said, deliver that to 3523 Avenue H. You're like, well, where's that, Pastor Tuttle? That is the residence of my father-in-law. <laughs> and every month, I'd call. Say, hey, uh, has that crackhead dropped his rent off yet? That... <laughs> And I just refinanced it again at 220. <laughs> Come on, what are you saying? I'm saying it's easy to find the negative. It's easy to find a hater. It's easy to find somebody that tell your marriage isn't gonna make it, the church isn't gonna make it. I've been listening to that my whole life. But you know what? I hear faith come by and say if you don't buy it, someone will. And in a few years, they're gonna cash out, refinance a blessing you missed out on. Don't you give up and don't you quit and don't you walk away, negative Nancy. Rebuild the wall, rebuild the wall. Come on, there's, there, there's a wall in my rubble. There's a home in my hell. There's a marriage in this mess. There's treasure in the trash. There's life coming out of the addiction. But there's a wall in my rubble. I said there's a wall in the rubble. Because he's the God that restores. He's the God that rebuilds. Look at your neighbor and say there's a wall in your rubble. Jeremiah says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring back, this is the promise, uh, here's the promise, uh, bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents uh, and have mercy on his dwelling place. Uh, the city shall be built upon it. He said, The city shall be built upon it. He's, I feel the word, man, I feel faith in this house today to tell you that the city's going to be built on its own mound. He's not going to find a new location, a new place, or a different person. He's going to take you. He's going to take you. Your mound, your mess. That's, it's not restoration if there's not a mess. It can't be rebuilt unless it's been tore down. It can't be put back together unless it's been broken. So restore it, God. Rebuild it, God. Put it back together, God.
God. Restore it. Take this trash heap and make a miracle out of it. Then out of them shall proceed. Next verse. Thanks. Woo! And the voice of those who you got to make it, Mary. Come on, some of you are waiting on it. It would just happen if you made it. Well, I'm not happy. Sometimes you have to make a joyful noise. You create. The reason it's not merry is because you're not making it merry. The reason it's not joyful is because you're not making it joyful. But you can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It doesn't say... Joyful noises aren't a response response to things good that happen. They are the creation of joy. That's what you've got to do is in your mess, start making merry. Start shouting. Start saying it's going to be all right. Hallelujah. I praise you. What are you doing? Why are you covered in dust every time you get home from church? Oh, I was just dancing in a mound of trash. I was just giving God praise in a heap of hell. That's why and I will multiply them (laughs) and they shall not diminish I will glorify them and you got to know that's one of my favorites they shall not be that means they will be they're going to be large he says I'm going to bless them and the way they come back will not be the way that they went into ruin they will be greater I will restore unto them greater Hallelujah. Oh, poke the neighbor. You ain't poked. Maybe they're behind you. Say, I'm coming back bigger. Huh? So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speeding to a close. I know y'all have high, high, high priority things that you need to get to. So if you're going to rebuild it, you got to have a preacher. You got to have a preacher. You got to have a Nehemiah. Three and one. Here's the ESV, it reads, Then Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brothers and priests, and they built the sheep gate, and they consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the tower of a hundred, as far as the tower of a... Y'all read this one, I gotta drink some water. Go for two. I chose to drink during the hard words. <laughs> That's why I deserve to be paid real good. Right there. Right there is why I deserve to be spoiled. You're welcome. And next to him, the men of Jericho. And next to them, Zakur. And next to them, Mermoth. And next to him, Meshutham. And next to them, Zadok. And next to him, and next to them, and next to him, and next to them, and next to him, 14 times. Nehemiah is working next to the Levites, and the Levites are working next to the Barak, and they're, they are alongside, the Bible says, the Benjamin. Benjamin, and who is next to Benihu, which is next to the Tegazites, which is next to Zadok, which is next to Hanan. They worked better. You got to have a preacher. If you're going to be restored, you got to have a Nehemiah that says, We can do it. And all of a sudden, faith. See, when I begin to preach, faith rises up. But the practical side of restoration. is who's next to you. How are we going to get it done, preacher? I can preach pretty sermons and get us believing all day long. That ain't going to be a problem. I do it. I'm a professional. But here's where you come in. You got to say, all right, I'll get next to you. Oh, but I really don't like them. You know, he's wearing that cheap perfume and I'm more into the more expensive and I'm actually allergic to it. We'll just sneeze away. You'll have to put on some, wear a mask. Come on. And if you don't like my tie, you can buy me one you do like. I'll wear that one. But one thing you better not do is let some little stupid, moronic little thing come in between us and separate us. We've got a wall to build. We got a life to restore. I 
need the church. I need the men of God. I need my brother and my sister. I need somebody's got to be next to you. Come on, I know you, come on, you're gonna hear great preaching all week and while you're preaching, you know what you ought to do? You ought to text five or six people and just say, I'm praying for you. I'm next to you. I've got your back. Not the same people in your friendship group. Look them up on the people app or find somebody that you go to church with and say, I'm with you. We got this together. I've got you. Go find. That's why I don't understand people that don't respond to altar calls. I think they're some of the most narcissistic people that exist. Because they don't want to stand next to people that are at their lowest. It's sad to me when I see broken people and I see people sitting out there that are whole. They stood next to you. When we have altar call, get yourself up to somebody and say, uh, come on, can I just get a witness of somebody ever been through hell? You've been through hell and you came to church uh, and it took a lot of courage to walk down that aisle. Matter of fact, all you could do is make it to right about here because you didn't want to clog it up. So you made it right here and you don't even know who it was, but you just felt the presence of somebody here and you felt the presence of somebody here and they put their hand on your back and all of a sudden you said, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I don't remember what he preached. I don't even know what he said. But I knew there was somebody next to me. You got to stay next to each other. Hey, he stay. Don't you let anything come in between each other. As I, as I clued, one, one of the most challenging phases of the Second World War was as the U.S. Air Force began to bomb strategic targets in Nazi Germany. In 1943, the raids commenced as they would fly into the industrial heartland, deep into enemy territory. The, the tool of choice for the Allies was the famed B-17 bomber. It was known as a flying fortress. The, the Brits' strategy was to bomb at night, but they could not see what they were targeting. So they were just bombing fields. But the Americans took a chance, knowing they would be easy targets to the flak. And they would send these B-17 bombers. Now each B-17 bomber had six 30 millimeter cannons that they could fire at fighter jets from the air. And yet the greatest defense the B-17 had was not its six cannons. It was an ability to fly in formation. In 1943, they did a survey in the U.S. Air Force, and the numbers said that over half the bombers that had been shot down by the Germans had been left without protection. They had left the main formation. So to address the problem, the United States develops a bomb group. They created an entire formation, new formation to address this problem called the bomb group formation. It was a combat box formation in which all B-17s could safely cover any others at all times with their machine guns. So this formation of bombers was a dangerous target as the enemy would come. As they would attack uh, a German fighter pilot likened attacking these B-17 combat box formations to encountering a flying porcupine. Because when he came against one, they were in a minimum of 12 formations. So he wasn't fighting six guns. He had 72 guns pointed at him. <sighs> Some of y'all waiting for the preaching point. I'm, I thought I'd done better than that, but... However, the B-17 pilots had to learn the discipline of staying in formation. That was the greatest challenge, was staying in formation. For while they would fly into enemy territory, they would be more susceptible to the flak from the ground, but they were less susceptible to the pilots 
in the air. There was some that would still, just instinct would take them off. Their chances of survival went down 81% and it opened up the entire formation for disaster. What are you saying, preacher? You can love great preaching and come and hear it and sit on the back row and be entertained by it and have great faith. But all of a sudden, hey, poof, you get shot and you think, well, you know what, I'll just... That's the trap of the wolf. The wolf never attacks the sheep in the herd. Hey, brother, did you hear what they said about you? You know what I think we need to do? We need to just come out here for a minute and we need to just have a little talk because all those people are against you and they have nothing to... <laughs> Oh, you, you're hurt, huh? Yeah, you didn't like that sermon when he was talking about you. That was pretty ugly, yeah. And look, here you are now. You're older, and you're a, you're a great, powerful missionary. And he's not really using you to your full capacity. You know what I think you should probably do? You should probably come out here. And you could... And you never see him again. You know why you never see him again? Because they're dead. Because the wolf goes after the wounded that gets out of formation. I said, it's okay to be wounded. It's okay to have, have one engine out and you're spinning on three and two are out. Now you're just, but don't you leave the formation. Don't you get out of formation. I'm in the Lord's army. I'm in the Lord's army. I said, I'm in the Lord's army. I march with his infantry. I fly. Come on, somebody. I fly with the formation. And when I'm wounded, I don't stray. I know you're going to get hurt. I've been shot. But the only thing that saved me and my crew was that I stayed with the body. I stayed with the body. Always stay with the body. Always stay with the church. And if you'll stay with the church, if you'll link up and say, get with me, get with me. You will build a wall in your rubble. You'll see restoration in your life. It'll come to pass the promises of God. Yes, I know you got faith, but my question is, can you now link up with somebody next to you? Here's what I want us to do. I, uh, I want somebody on this side of the church to meet somebody on this side of the church in the middle and someone right about here to get over with somebody. And I need you just to get arm in arm, arm in arm, arm in arm, get arm in arm, get arm in arm, get arm in arm. Link up, link up, lady with a lady, brother with a brother. Link up. Mm. Link up. I can push one person down, but if he's linked up to another, he'll pull him up. Can a threefold cord? A threefold cord. Well, I got a personal relationship. Yes, you do, and you have to to be saved. And the reason you have a personal relationship is because you got a preacher that preached to you and told you to. And the reason you're linked up with somebody right now is because you know I cannot. What a, what a selfish and a satanic concept to think that you alone can find and rebuild. Nehemiah said, I, I'm a great preacher, he said. I can motivate people, but I need Judah to be singing. I need the Levites working. I need Benjamin, and I need them all linked together. And as you stand shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, Already, there's a transferring of faith that's beginning to go through you. And it's going to compound throughout this moment. As you begin to pray and lift your voice, you don't have to know what to say. You can just begin to pray. But as you begin to pray, all of a sudden, just because of who you're linked to, come on, I feel like there's... The wall may not be built at once. It's going to be the process. The Bible says it was stone by stone. It was step by step. And today I initiate a restoration process. I feel the Holy Ghost is warning somebody that's been disconnecting. You've been disconnecting. I don't know what it was. Don't you let anything disconnect you. That's why every time I can, every chance I can, I try to link my life to God's people. I want my life intertwined. I want my close friendships to be God's people. Come on, I want those, my kids to marry God's people. I want my brotherhood to be God's people. I need, I need to be shoulder to shoulder. I can't. Come on, guard yourself. Come on. and
There's a miracle coming. There's a hope coming. There's restoration coming. There's a, there's a miracle. There's a miracle. There's a wall. There's a wall in the rubble. That I, I know the wall is not the tabernacle. I know the wall is not the temple. But if I don't build the wall, we can't build the temple. And if I don't build the temple, I can't see Messiah. So it's a chain. It's a, it's a process. And so I'm going to pick up this brick and build a wall. So the wall can make way for the temple. So that the temple can make way for the Messiah. So the Messiah can make way for the blood. Which will wash me white as snow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can let them go, but put your hand on their head if it's appropriate, or lay your hand on their chest, brother with a brother. Come on, take her hand now and begin to just intercede for a moment in the Holy Ghost. Yay! Yeah. Oh, oh, Jesus, I need you. Of course you need him. He's perfect. Jesus, I need a word. Of course you need a word. It's the source of your faith. But what you need right now is to be in unity with the body linked up with a brother ah I know I know the last one messed you up and hurt you but you gotta heal that you gotta get back in the only one hurting with you disconnected is you you gotta get in you gotta get in I wonder if you could begin to give him praise and thanks right there where you're at with whoever you're with somebody shout Jesus Shout Jesus. All across the front, from that very corner to that very corner, I want us to have a line of men, or it doesn't matter, men and women linked up shoulder to shoulder, and I want you to be arm in arm. I'm going to preach a message called The Theology of the Net. So I need to try this. All the way across, all the way to there, right there. Now I need you to be linked up arm in arm. When Jesus called his disciples, the primary occupation of disciples was fishermen. He called them while they were in fishing, but the way that they fished was not with a fishing pole. They fished with a net. A fishing rod is one long line. It has one reel with one long line, but a net is just a little bunch of little lines linked together like this and he's teaching them something about being fishers of men okay hypothetically let's say that I'm the promise and y'all want to catch me come get me ooh someone almost did There's some promises you're missing because you're soloing. But man, if you'd ever link up with a net, your promise couldn't get away. That's the theology of nets. You got to get with somebody say, I'll be little and not care. Who gets the credit now? The net gets the credit. I don't have to be the one that brags. I just want the promise. I just want to be a part of the promise. Now what you need to do is link up with somebody one more time and just begin to give God praise. Look at him and say, well, let's go get my promise. Let's go get my promise. Let's go get my child. Let's go get my neighbor, my friend, and my brother. I got to get with you. <laughs> Yay! I can't do it by myself. I can't make it on my own. 
I've got to have you. I've got to have you. You don't look like me, smell like me, act like me, like the things I like. You're not the color I am or the generation I'm from, but, but I'm gonna link up with you. I got a promise to catch you. I'm a fisher. I'm a fisher of men. Woo! Somebody shout yay! Hallelujah. Thank you, Ned. No wonder, no wonder the devil don't want you part of a church. No wonder the devil don't want you linked up, thinking you can catch it by yourself. Nah, when you link up, you'll catch more than your boat can bear. How do we catch all the fish in Viter? It ain't about Matthew Tuttle. He's just the Nehemiah for the Leha. This says, let's do it. And then we link up. And we go out into the world as a net. And we catch every person in promise and change our world. Father, I thank you for your people. Let's lift our hands. I thank you for your people. I thank you for your promise. And I thank you for this holy place. People, dear God, that have made themselves available. Putting aside idiosyncrasies, different.